Let's stand together. Worship the Lord this morning. Thank you. 
thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather as your people and receive from you. Lord, we love you and praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. All Amen. God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. We're going to take a couple minutes to uh, wander around and say hey to the Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Good, good. Glad to hear it. Well, if there's anyone new and visiting our church, I think I saw some new faces uh, already. And as a church body, we just want to welcome you with uh, putting our hands together. So glad to have you with us, and we pray uh, your time here is blessed, and the Lord would just um, just anoint you, and uh, that His countenance would shine upon you, and you would just get all that the Lord wants to speak to you today out of His message. But before we talk about the message a little bit and get into some announcements. Last night we had a great teaching um, by uh, Pastor Phil. Uh, the study of the message, uh, excuse me, the title of the message was Navigating the Minefield. Matthew chapter 22 just took a survey of the entire chapter. And it was so great as we got to, Phil mentioned our hero, uh, Jesus and uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and also the Herodians tried to throw Jesus some curveballs with some really tricky questions so they could box him in a corner. And it just didn't work out too well for him. So, uh, what a great study. If you haven't had an opportunity to um, listen to it or be here uh, uh, last evening, uh, you can uh, check out our website, uh, see the audio in the, uh, in the sermon section, or also you can head to the bookstore and get a CD. I encourage you. It was, it was a great message. Uh, Pastor Ron is going to take us through verses 1 through 14. If you notice in your bulletins, you'll have the sermon notes for him. Uh, specifically, going to take a look at Here Comes the Bride. A parable that Jesus uses to speak about the kingdom of heaven uh, and uh, really looking forward to a great time in first service and I'm sure it will be the same uh, as we learned this uh, morning into the afternoon also inside your bulletins there's a welcome form especially um, we would encourage those of you that are new uh, as we welcome you we also want to know how we might be able to minister to your needs spiritually physically uh, if you have prayer requests please let us know what those are the welcome form is in the bulletin we'd encourage you once you fill it out you can drop it off one of the two tithes and offerings boxes located in the back of the sanctuary. Now for additional announcements, and before I get into mine, I'd like to invite up Jenny Sanchez, who's going to share with us a couple things uh, concerning the ladies, a book club, and also women's breakfast. Good morning. Good morning. Um, on Mother's Day, Ron and Whitney took me, I got it took me to see the Norman Rockwell exhibit at the Tacoma Art Museum, which is really good if you want to go. And um, one of the paintings that he did was uh, called The Problem That We All Live With, which depicted Ruby Bridges. But anyway, yesterday I got to go and see her, hear her talk, and got to meet her, um, which was just thrilling <laughs> for me, and has nothing to do with what I need to announce, <laughs> except I'll um, try and segue into the book club. We're going to be starting a book club June 14th on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Um, this year, we're going to read the book, The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. It's uh, written by Hannah Whittle Smith, who was a Quaker um, in the 1800s. And it's a really, really wonderful book, um, a lot about surrender and believing God at his word. So that begins, you need to order your books in the bookstore by, I believe, June 5th is the date that we set for that. So, and have the first two chapters of that book read by June 14th at our first meeting, and that will be meeting at my home. And the second announcement is about the women's breakfast. We've been praying for the last few months about what the Lord would have those look like whether we were going to start them again or not and we really believe that the Lord has led us in that um, so they'll be starting back up June 18th it'll be the third Saturday of every month and that'll be a time where we come together and eat and really get to know one another over food which is always great and um, especially new members and then um, we'll have a time of prayer together where we'll lift up our needs and the needs of women and really the needs of the body of Christ as a whole. Um, so we're really excited about that. We feel like the Lord has really um, answered a prayer. We believe that the um, fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I got that wrong for service. But we really want to see the availing work of the Lord. Um, he accomplishes great things. Um, and we get to run the race with him. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jenny.
All right, concerning today's activities, two specific announcements that I want to make about today are some reminders. Home uh, Fellowship Barbecue. Remember, we're shutting down the home fellowships uh, for the summer months, but before we do that, we're going to close it out by bringing everybody together and enjoying the barbecue and fellowship together. Uh, and that is uh, actually, it says De Corsi, but if you go down 7th Avenue on left, it's actually uh, Clark's Creek North. Just look for the softball field, look for the tennis courts. We're gonna be there, barbecue, we're gonna have a great time. If you don't go to a home fellowship, we still encourage you, please come out uh, and uh, meet some people that go to home fellowships and maybe decide if you'd like to go when we start them back up again uh, after the summer months. Also, for children's ministry, Pastor Allen has come up a couple times and talked about uh, the Bible drills uh, that uh, children's ministry is going to go through. Uh, parents, the information meeting is today in the sanctuary, so please find Pastor Ellen, uh, come here, and that'll be uh, after service, and you can have all of your questions answered and get all the information that you need to take your kids through the Bible drill. Amen? I'm looking forward to that uh, and just training our kids up in the Lord with Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. You can't go wrong with that. Uh, next up is Missions Fiesta. We've been talking about this for quite some time. We do have need for, if I'm correct, uh, more items for the auction, correct? Uh, for donations. So please, uh, you have a, uh, I believe there's a flyer in here, and also there's a Missions Fiesta table as well. We really want to take the opportunity to bless uh, four of our missionary groups uh, that we support in our church, and we can do that by donating items for the auction, attending the event, uh, and uh, any questions that you may have about the items to donate, you can see the individuals uh, at the table out in the foyer. So please be mindful of that. Uh, next up, also in donations, uh, speaking of donations, you'll notice if you go to the information table, all these baby bottles that we're carrying around. Uh, this isn't something new that we're doing at the church to put water in them to make sure we're hydrated. Uh, we're actually putting change in them because uh, we're um, uh, getting ready to donate that money to um, adoptions ministry uh, that we're supporting. Uh, so we encourage you, if you haven't taken a bottle yet or you have taken some and, and you have more change to donate, uh, you can see the individuals at the information table and they have the places where you can drop off a bottle with change in them and also pick up another bottle to put some change in. Uh, so please be mindful of that as well. Uh, last announcement before we go into housekeeping items is uh, the Men at Work. And I talked a little bit about Men at Work. What a great opportunity that we have to serve other people, see some men nodding their heads. They had such a great time. Uh, it was so fulfilling to the men. We had plenty of people come up to us uh, and mention that we should make this a full-time ministry in the church. And so we had a men's a leadership team meeting. And what we did decide to do uh, in the meantime, uh, and, and, and uh, the summer months, we're actually going to, in place of our men's breakfast, we're going to continue men at work. Uh, through the summer months and then we'll just keep continuing to pray about it and see what the Lord would have us do to continue it on or maybe make it a full-time ministry so I just want to encourage the men great opportunity to serve once again uh, and if you have individuals that you think uh, we might be able to do some yard work or projects at their house please let us know so the next one is going to be June 11th second Saturday of each month now in the summer months starting at 7 30 a.m. usually grab a breakfast burrito or something else that the man in ministry cooks up head out and uh, we get some good work done for the Lord amen Amen. Great time. Now, uh, if you have a cell phone or any other electronic device that may distract during the service, now is a perfect time while I'm doing some housekeeping items to turn those off. Uh, if you need to leave the sanctuary at any time during the teaching of the Word, we simply ask that as you enter back in, uh, you can find uh, there's some seats back there, some seats in the last few rows, and that always helps uh, minimize distractions. And now let's bow our heads in prayer. Because without the Lord, we can do nothing, right? All things are possible with the Lord, and we want to have a great service. So let's ask the Lord just to bless it. Father, thank you so much uh, that we have the opportunity just to come before you, Lord, and bow our knees before you, Lord, knowing who you are and knowing that we can do nothing, Lord, uh, without you. Uh, we need you, Lord. We need you to speak personally to our hearts, specifically, Lord, the things that you need us to hear. Guard us against any distractions. Uh, and uh, just allow us just to have a blessed time, Lord, uh, in, in this house, Lord, that you've allowed us. Um, to spend time with you and we ask these things in Jesus name amen we've got pastor on up here and also uh, if we can open up the doors I believe we have some special guests that are going to be spending some time with us yes. for a little bit That's right. today is uh, children's ministry appreciation Sunday and so let's welcome our little guests as they're coming <laughs> I'm not sure some of them are panicking about now, okay. Others are actually leading the teachers in here. 
And she come and sit here and then and face the podium, face the, the stage so you can worship with us, okay? Hi. How are you? Come and look this way so I can see your happy faces. How are you? Oh, there's a lot of them. Huh? You just keep coming. We are so blessed as a church to have a team of committed young adults and adults who are just committed to ministering to the spiritual needs of our children. And uh, we as a church take very seriously the role of instructing a child in the way that they should go. And how are you? How are you? That's a beautiful flower in your hair. You're welcome. And I think a lot of times we can, uh, we can take for granted what goes on on that side of the church and on this side of the church every Sunday. Uh, I don't know about you, but, but I, can, I can do that sometimes. And I love this time of year when we bring all the kids in and we have a talk, an opportunity to pray for the children's ministry workers. And I want to encourage you today and really every week to thank your children's teachers for the investment. You know, we require um, we require that teachers come to both services, that when you teach in the children's ministry, you, can, you have to come to at least one of the services to be fed and equipped. You can't give away something that you don't have yourself. And so we encourage them to come for one of the services, and then the other service, while you're in here being ministered to, they're actually in, the, uh, in their classrooms uh, ministering to your little ones. And what a tremendous blessing that is, amen? Um, the Bible is very clear that unless you come to me as a little child, you'll not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was very clear that if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, they would be better with a millstone tied around their neck and thrown into the sea. He does not take lightly. And uh, we, we just hear all the time uh, just uh, about the... Just the, the abuse of children, the, uh, just how they, they use children in, in just terrible ways. And we're grateful that we can be a part of a church that embraces our children. And we're especially grateful to you teachers who sacrifice week after week, Wednesday after Wednesday, Sunday after Sunday, Saturday evenings. And we think of those nights when you had a full week and all of a sudden, it's Saturday night again, you've had a full day on Saturday, and you realize, oh dear Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make it through uh, tomorrow. Give me strength. And there's people that are praying for you, and we know that there are times when we're doing our own thing, and you're preparing your lesson, and we want you to know how very much we appreciate that. So if any of you are involved in any way with the children's ministry, as an assistant, as a teacher, would you please uh, stand? Just right where you are. Just go ahead and stand right where you are, including the, the teachers that have come. Any of you that are, that are involved in the children's ministry or the nursery or anything, just stand right where you are. And then if some of you who are right around them, if you would just lay your hand on their shoulder or on their, on their back, or uh, uh, and, and we want to be able to pray with them. And I want to invite uh, Kayla Trujillo. Where is, where is Kayla? Come on up. She's going to start our prayer. Thanks for doing this, Kayla. She's going to start our prayer uh, by praying for the teachers, uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll finish it up. So you pray however the Lord lays on your heart, okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for all the teachers that they know what you, what you put on their hearts. And, to, for, and they teach us all the things that they know about you, Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for these dear teachers. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord God, just for giving them to us. 
And we thank you, Lord, that, that, uh, that they're willing to sacrifice their, their time and their effort to minister the love of Jesus to these precious little lambs. We're so very grateful for them, Lord God. We ask that you would bless them greatly as a result of their labors and their efforts. We ask that you would encourage them, Lord God. We pray that they would continue, Lord God, and that they would recognize, Lord, each day, each opportunity they have to minister, that they would recognize the incredible value and worth that that is to these children, Lord. We know that the that, that, that early childhood years and into uh, their preteens, Lord, are critical times for them to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would use them in a mighty way to bring them to that place of absolute surrender to you. We thank you for them. We rejoice in their birth. We rejoice in their service to our church. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's thank those people. Amen. We also want to remind you, teachers, that as you're leaving uh, the service uh, today, there's a special little gift that uh, we've prepared for you just to thank you for your faithful service. And now, kids, you know what we're going to do now? You know what we're going to do? We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Do you guys pray in your, in your children's ministry? Do you pray? Do you? Why do we pray? Who can tell me why it is that we pray? Why do we pray? God says we're supposed to. That's very true. Why else? What happens when we pray? Yes, Jewel. He'll answer it. That's right. That's right. And what does praying mean? What does that actually mean when we pray? Yes. What do Because Jesus wants us to do it. Yes, Anna. So we can tell Jesus what we need and stuff. Uh, that's exactly right. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to tell Jesus what we need and stuff. Okay? Stuff's a great word. Because it just kind of, it, it encapsulates everything that we forgot to pray about. We pray for Jesus, to Jesus the things we need and stuff. When you go grocery shopping, you get what's on your list and stuff. Okay? So that's what we're going to do right now. Okay, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus, your word does tell us that we're to pray. And that's what we're going to do right now. And we want to pray especially, Lord, for those who are sick and not feeling well. Lord, we, we pray for our little brother, Cortez Quintanilla, Lord God, who's been sick had surgery, Lord, and we just ask in Jesus' name that you would heal him. We pray, Lord God, for those who are looking for work. Lord Jesus, you tell us in the Bible that we're not to worry about what we're to eat, we're not to worry about how to pay the bills, that you're faithful to provide for us, and we believe that you'll do that. Lord, we want to pray for Lindsley's friend, Shelly, whose son died this last week. And Lord, we're thankful that he knew you as Lord, and we thank you that he lives in heaven with you right now. We want to pray, Lord, that you'd be with Charles and those who go to the mall to tell other people about Jesus. We, because that's what you've told us to do. You've told us to pray, and you've told us to go out and to tell other people about Jesus. And we ask that you would just help Charles and those people to be able to share Jesus with them and that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray for those who are fighting in the military, in the Army, in the Marines, in the Navy, in the Air Force, Lord God. Would you watch over them and protect them and bring them home safely to us, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for all of those who are serving in, all of the missionaries who are serving in foreign countries. And we ask, Lord, that your hand would be upon them, watching over them, protecting them, and what a wonderful thing it is, Lord, that you're able to be all at the same place at the same time. We don't understand that, but we love that. We love how you're able to be here with us right now. And then also, Lord, to be with people in Mexico and in China and in Europe and every place else. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for our church. And we thank you that you love us and that you want to minister to all of our needs. Thank you for these times of prayer and the opportunity you give us to talk to you. 
We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for this day. Okay, we're going to spend some time worshiping the Lord now. Okay, shall we all stand up? And let's worship the Lord today. Yeah, so uh, every Sunday I've been given the awesome privilege to uh, do worship for your children. And it is an awesome privilege. And it's humbling. And most part of our worship is interactive. So we do hand motions and all kinds of things. So Julian's going to show you that part. So, all right, keep your eyes on Julian.
like this we just get a little glimpse of what it'll be like in heaven and how it is Lord that we'll gladly trade our sorrows and our, and our pain our sickness our sadness and we'll experience Lord the glorious joy of being in the presence of our King thank you Lord God for this morning Thank you that out of the mouths of babes, out of the mouths of these children, we've been blessed and encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> Have a good class. How many of you adults 
as you were singing, as you were singing that, um, I've traded my pain, said, I wish I could trade my pain right now. I mean, in your body. Some of you were actually going through the hand motions and grabbing, but you were grabbing body parts that were really aching and really hurting. <clears throat> I love, I absolutely love kissing my little grandchildren. I love just nibbling on their little cheeks and, and, and just their skin is so soft. And as I look in the mirror and watch transformation take place, it's, it's where do we get like some of these spots and bumps and, and these, the kids, they just don't have, their skin is so fresh and is so tender. Listen, when we come into the presence of the Lord, He's going to give us a new body. Amen. How many of you ready for the new body? Amen. Bring, bring it on. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. <clears throat> and one of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. Keep it raised. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. You know, before we get started, I, I do want to just make a couple of, of comments on this whole end of the world fiasco that we, <laughs> that we went through yesterday. And that was supposed to have taken place yesterday. Would you hold your place there and just turn over a page or two to Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. We're going to be getting to that chapter in just a few weeks. But I have to say that uh, I, was, I was grieved on Friday as I heard all of the talk shows mockingly talking about uh, Harold Camping and uh, his claim that the end of the world was coming on May 21st. One merchant supposedly had a sale that said, Jesus saves 50% off sale, no returns. And I think about all of the reasons sometimes that we as Christians can give people to mock the things of God. Look at what Jesus said in verse 36. Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour, that is speaking of the rapture, the beginning of the end of the world as we know it, no one knows. He says, of that day, an hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And as I think about what uh, many people believed would take place yesterday and it not happening, I think of how awesome it is that we have the Word of God, who tells us, warns us about false prophecies, about false prophets who misinterpret the very clear Word of God. When Jesus Himself said, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It was one radio host that I was listening to who would call himself a Christian, though I'm confident he is not, just by hearing him over the years, the things that he believes and talks about. Remember what we talked about last week, the 76% of Americans who identify themselves as Christian. And he made the comment that he would probably be leaving, that he would probably get taken with the rapture. And others, he listed by name in the station who worked for him, uh, his program manager and the, and the like, and his engineer, and he listed them by name who would be getting judged, who would be getting left behind. To which one commented this, he said, quote, I will be sitting at the right hand of God juggling. End quote. And yet we know, according to the Word of God, 
that for all those who refuse to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, who do not take to heart his words, which though it does tell us that he will return, it does not tell us when he will return. And unfortunately, they will not be sitting at the right hand of God, which is reserved for Jesus. But rather, they will stand before a holy and a righteous God, and their knees will bow before Jesus. They will confess his name as Lord, and then according to his word, they will be cast into outer darkness. And I find what a tremendous comfort we can take in God's word which keeps us on track. It keeps us in a good place of knowing <clears throat> the truths about the end of the world, about what will happen when the trumpet of God does blow. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. The Bible is clear that the end of the world is coming. And the Lord has called us to be ready. For we do not know the time nor the hour when this will take place. But as we will see in a few weeks in chapter 24, the signs of the Lord's return are all around us. And though we don't know when this will take place, we must be ready to that, to be ready when that time does come. We are, it is important that we are determined to find ourselves busy doing the things that the Lord would have us be doing rather than going on about things as if it weren't going to happen. Now one of those events that the Bible tells us we do have to look forward to is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. You see, there is a wedding that is coming. And it is going to be the most glorious wedding you could ever imagine. I mean, you talk about a royal wedding. It is going to be the royal weddings of all wedding. And Jesus, the Bible tells us, is the bridegroom. And we, the church, are his bride. So will you stand with me? And let's look at Matthew chapter 22, uh, beginning in verse 1. Let's read together. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find invite to the wedding, so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together for all whom they had found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And so he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. 
And then the king said to the servants, Bind him, hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We acknowledge, Lord, the, the challenges of the times in which we live. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would draw near to those who were misled this last week into believing uh, a contradiction to what your very words declare. No one knows the day or the hour in which you will return. And I pray, Lord, that by the Holy Spirit you would draw them to a place of, of looking at your word, that they would not follow the false teaching of man. We pray, Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection around this place, guarding us from any distraction that would hinder what you want to accomplish, what you want to speak to us, O oh Lord. We give you free reign, Lord God, that you would instruct us from this amazing parable that Jesus spoke of the wedding feast. Speak to our hearts now, O oh Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Well, we've learned that the purpose of parables, the purpose of the parables, it was to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It was to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven to those who were seeking to understand spiritual truths, to understand the mysteries of God. Simply stated, the parables were stories to illustrate spiritual truths. Stories to illustrate spiritual truths. And in the scriptures, Jesus is clearly represented as the bridegroom, and we are his bride. Isaiah 54, 5 says, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. Now we know that that's an Old Testament reference to God, but we also know that Jesus was responsible for creation. Colossians 1 and, and uh, John chapter 1 tell us that. We also know that Jesus was God incarnate, that Jesus was God born as man, fully retaining his Godhood. John the Baptist, he makes reference to Jesus as the bridegroom. When the disciples, they began to get worried about this new guy named Jesus who was baptizing people. And we read in John chapter 3 verse 27, where John said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Jesus, who has the bride, is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, John is referring to himself, but the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. I love that picture of John pointing people to Jesus and saying, I'm not the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. It's as if John is saying, I'm the best man. And I love that picture. Can you imagine being the best man for Jesus? Will you hold your place there with me and just head over to the right and go to the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. You're going to come across Galatians and then Ephesians. If you hit Colossians or Philippians, you've gone uh, too far. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. And we're going to look at some scripture which really speaks so very clearly of this relationship between Jesus and his church. Jesus and his church being the very same as a husband and his wife. A husband and his bride. And we read in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. I love this picture of this relationship. I think there's great benefit to understanding this relationship of Jesus with the church, Jesus with his bride, and us as husbands with our brides. I often tell young couples who are getting married, and I especially tell the husband, your role is not to mold and shape her into who you think she should be. 
Your role is to create an environment for her, for God to speak into her life. And I, like many husbands, I've uh, gone to the Lord and I've, I've thought, okay, I need to bring some things up to the Lord to straighten my wife out because she's out of line here in a few, in a few areas. And inevitably, I go to the Lord and the Lord says, you know, you've got the wrong agenda because the one that needs to get straightened out is you. You're the problem here. And uh, I have to tell you, far more times than not, that has been the case. And so it's dangerous to consider the scriptures and this picture of Jesus' relationship with his church and how we as husbands are to be relating to our brides. Just as Christ is head of the church and savior of the body, verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, for his bride, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And that's just what Jesus did for us. He sanctified us. He cleansed us by the washing of water, representative of the Holy Spirit and God's word. Verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Again, another picture of what Jesus did for us. Do you remember when he did that? When he made us holy, without spot, without blemish. Verse 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You see, he wanted us to understand something very important about Jesus' relationship with us, his church. We've been having a lot of weddings here lately, South Hill Calvary Chapel. Love is, is in the air. There's a bug out there, and if you're not careful, you're going to get bit by the bug. I mean, it's been happening. First, it was Ben uh, Spector and Emily Bethune. They got married uh, just about a month ago. And then two weeks ago, Jason Paul and Jennifer Ingham got married. And this coming Monday, uh, a, week, a week from tomorrow, actually, Travis Sharp and Melissa Harris are getting married. I'm going to be doing the wedding ceremony. I enjoy those. And, and unfortunately, they're getting married in Phoenix, Arizona and they asked if I'd be willing to go to Arizona to do the wedding and being the servant of God that I am willing to lay my life down for the sheep I said I would sacrifice some time in the Sun and do their wedding pray for me as I bask in the Sun actually do pray for me because it's an outdoor wedding I have a black suit and I've heard that the day of the wedding, it's supposed to be 105 degrees. So I'll have to, they'll probably have to rush me to the pool or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I really enjoy doing weddings. And one of my favorite parts of the wedding is when the door opens and the bridegroom sees his bride all dressed in white walking down the aisle sometimes to the traditional <clears throat> here comes the bride and I love it in particular when you know weddings have changed over the years and it used to be that there was the tradition that you, you couldn't see your bride until at the altar and and now we've got to get the photos done and we've got to get all that done and and but I but I love this this wedding Travis and Melissa there he's not going to see her till the wedding and that's especially sp special and, and even when they do I, I just love that moment when the doors open and everybody stands and you can just hear the group I mean they just can't even believe what they're beholding there as kids we used to uh, sing um, here comes the bride Remember, here comes the bride, big, fat, and wide. Here comes the groom, skinny as a broom. Now, that's not a politically correct um, way to sing that song now. That's the way we... Anybody 
say, did anybody else sing that when you were a kid? Thank the good Lord. I'd have been in deep trouble if that hadn't been the case. But I love that moment. That moment when the doors open. And I love thinking about it in context of our marriage to the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 21.1 Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. I remember how exciting it was anticipating coming home from my honeymoon, realizing that never more would I have to say goodnight and part ways. When my youngest son uh, married our daughter-in-law, Natalie, I asked him what was one of the things that he looked most forward to about being married, and he said this, quote, I'm looking forward to being with Natalie all the time. We've had countless days when we were always have to say goodbye at the end of the day. I'm looking forward to not having to say goodbye anymore, but to just be able to say goodnight. End quote. You see, the day is coming. The day is coming when we will physically be with Jesus to always be with him for all eternity. In Matthew chapter 9, the disciples of John came to Jesus and they said, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast, Jesus said. Listen, Jesus has temporarily been taken away from the earth. But as we said earlier, he will return. And so this parable which we're looking at this morning, it's a picture of a wedding. A wedding that God had prepared for His Son, Jesus Christ. And the wedding guests in this parable represent those who come to be married to the bridegroom, not simply guests of the wedding. And Jesus said in verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king, representing God, who arranged a marriage for His Son, representing Jesus and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Now I know that uh, many of you would agree that the invitation list is one of the most challenging aspects of planning the wedding, isn't it? It always starts small. Oh honey, let's just have a small wedding and then it just begins to grow. Well, we can't forget this person we can't forget the postman. He's the one delivering all of the wedding invitations. Well, we can't forget the people at the post office. They're the ones sorting the invitations. And it goes on and on and on. And before you know it, you have more people than you can handle. And then you still manage to forget someone. How many of you have had that conversation? Are you going to the wedding? Well, we didn't get an invitation. Well, I'm sure they meant to invite you. Oh, come on. They're not even going to notice. You know, they're going to be off in cloud nine. Why don't you go ahead and come with us? And some of you know, especially the guys, they're great at that because they've figured out what they're going to eat at the wedding. And so they're not that concerned about the wedding. They want to go eat at the wedding. And so with the wife, go, oh, no, honey, we didn't get an invitation. We're not going. We're not going. How many of you wives have told your husbands that? You know that you have. And your husbands, you're trying to talk them in, into going. Now here's the most awesome thing about this wedding that Jesus is talking about in this parable is that is this, everyone's invited. Absolutely everyone is invited to this wedding. And those who are invited, they represent those whom God is inviting to accept His invitation to be saved. And God desires that all would come to the wedding. He desires that all would come to salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 Timothy 2, 3, I love this one. Listen, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires that all would come to the wedding. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. And so Jesus points out here that the question is not whether they were invited or not, but rather they weren't interested in coming. And clearly, there were those whom it says were not willing to come. Now, in the context of this parable, those who were not willing to come represent those who willfully reject the invitation to come to faith in Jesus Christ and thereby face condemnation. Again, verse 4, the king sent out other servants. Now, we're going to see in a moment that these servants represent prophets who had foretold of Jesus as the Messiah, as the bridegroom. He sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Now, I love how you just see the longing heart of God wanting people to come to the wedding. Notice what it says, I've prepared my dinner, uh, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, all things are ready. It's going to be an amazing, amazing feast. Those whom the king initially invites represents the Jews. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, just prior to being stoned, he spoke of how they had treated these servants of God who, as we have seen in Jeremiah, had been warning people of the judgment that was coming if they refused to be obedient to the ways of God. And in Acts 7.51, he said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, he's speaking to the Jews, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so you do also. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So he said they would send these prophets out and they would reject them. Will you hold your place there and turn just a couple of books over to John chapter 16, verse 5. John 16, 5. The greatest servant of all to testify of the bridegroom, to testify of Jesus and to invite people to the wedding is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who invited us to the wedding. Look at verse 5, John 16, 5. Now, but now I go away to him who sent me, Jesus said, and none of you asks me where are you going. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, that is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. Therefore I said that He will take of Mine and declare it to you. And so the Lord has made every effort to invite people to come. To invite people to come, inviting them to come to the wedding that they might participate in that marriage supper of the Lamb. And the Holy Spirit is one of them. He sent many prophets and He raised up many preachers of the Word, of which I am gladly one of them, to invite people to come. 
There are so many times, week after week, month after month, year after year, when I look out upon and I can generally just tell uh, when somebody's interested in the things of the Lord or they're not interested in the things of the Lord. And I invite people to come. And yet Jesus is saying here that many refuse. And in fact, not only do they refuse, but it says they mock those who are calling them to repentance. Just like they mocked Jeremiah, who for 40 years cried out to people, repent, turn away from your ways and turn towards God. Jeremiah 27, O Lord, he writes, you induced me and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Derision daily means I'm la the laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me, he said. It tells us in verse 5 that, or, or, or it says that he had sent these other servants out to invite people to come. And then in verse 5, but they, that is the Jews who were invited, made light of it. They made light of the invitation. And they went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. They had other things to do. This is the scoffing I spoke of earlier. Everybody thinking that this Jesus thing, of this heaven and the end of the world, and all that comes with it is just one big joke, one big fairy tale, and people who are weak, they use it as a crutch. And that's what makes me sad about the events that took place this last week. We knew that the Lord wasn't going to come back yesterday. We knew that. How did we know that? Because Jesus said that it wasn't going to happen. And yet so many people come in the name of Christ. And they just, they say things that are, that are just, they're not sound in accordance with the word of God. And that's why Jesus said, as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And the reality is that the day is going to come when the Lord is going to take his church. And there will be people left behind. Verse 6 says that they went so far and the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully or spitefully, and killed them. In chapter 23, we read of Jesus' harsh words to the Pharisees, to the religious Jews who should have known better. They were supposed to be experts of the law and the prophets, and yet they got all caught up in their prestige and their accolades and, and the big business of religion, and they completely ignored the messenger and they, the message and they killed the messenger. Matthew 23, 37, when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who, who, who are sent to her. They came to warn you of the things to come. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, they didn't like the message. There's a lot of people today, they don't like the message. There may be some of you here, you don't like the message. And so the answer is, let's kill the messenger. And maybe it'll go away. But thanks be to God, with this life-giving message, many have been trying to put it to death from the beginning, but they cannot. It keeps going on and on and on and on, and it will until the return of the Lord. Amen. Praise be to God. We've seen this consistency in the life of Jeremiah, even in the midst of great persecution and tribulation and people rejecting him and beating him and laughing at him and mocking him. Jeremiah writes in 26.2, uh, Jeremiah 26.2, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words I command you to speak to them. Do not diminish a word. Now there are times that I speak things from God's Word, things that He puts on my heart, and I know that people don't like it. And I know, I know that they get angry. And I know, I mean, I've seen, I've shared with you before, I've seen people get up in the middle of a message and walk out. They put their Bible over there, and you can just tell. They're just thinking, I'm out of here. But the Lord said, do not diminish my words. You speak the things that I tell you to speak. Because He's dealing with things that have eternal consequence. When the king heard about it, verse 7, he was furious. Think for a moment how you felt when someone you loved rejected an invitation. 
Someone you love that you just, you've invited them to an event. Maybe you've invited them to church. You've invited them to a wedding. You've invited them to a birthday party. Maybe just over to your house for dinner and think how, they, how you felt when they rejected that invitation. Because maybe they weren't comfortable with you. Maybe they didn't want to hear about the newfound faith in Christ that you just had. Think of how God must feel when people consistently reject His message. When the king heard about it, verse 7, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Now that prophetically took place in 70 AD when under the Roman emperor Titus, he came in and destroyed Jerusalem, burned it. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. That is by their own refusal to accept. Again, in the context of this parable, Jesus is speaking here of the Jews who were not willing to listen to his invitation. And so the king, representing God, he turns from his original guest list, the Jews, and he opens it up to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. Now it's important to note here that we know from Scripture that it is because of their hardened hearts that, they, that He turned them over to blindness, but clearly He is not done with the Jews. They're still His chosen people, and their eyes will be opened again. Now, most anyone could have told you who understands this how the talks with President Obama and Netanyahu would have gone. Our nation is slowly turning its back on Israel. And we shouldn't be surprised when we look in the, in the uh, prophetic scriptures and see that the United States isn't in there. The Bible says that He will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. And we as a nation have stood with Israel for a very long time. In fact, when we go over there, I've talked to the locals there in Israel and they say, including the Palestinians, that they are not that impressed with our president. But they do love our nation because over the years we have stood with them. And now we have a leadership that's saying, no, it's time to divide the land. The land that God proclaimed was, belonged to the Jews and was to remain with them. When it's all said and done, that land isn't going to be divided. Oh, we may see some sort of temporary division and turmoil, but just look at Revelation and see who owns the land when it's all said and done. When you read Romans chapter 11, it speaks clearly of this truth. And Paul begins in Romans 11.1, 1, I say then, has God cast away His people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. This whole idea that God is through with the Jews, that they miss their opportunity and the church has replaced them is called replacement theology and it simply is not biblically correct. And when you read Romans 11 and Revelation, you see that clearly the Jews' eyes are opened and they return to the Lord. But we also see in Scripture, in the day of Jesus, and the Lord told the Apostle Paul, he said, now I'm sending you to proclaim the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. And verse 9, he says, therefore go into the highways and as many as you find, whoever you run across, you just start inviting them to the wedding. Oh, I look forward to the day when you get so ignited for Jesus, you get so on fire, to, that you just, bam, you just start inviting people to church. Well, why do you want me to come? You just got to come. You just got to come and hear you got to hear what, what God speaks through His Word. He says, go out. Whoever you run across, invite to the wedding. Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. And so verse 10 says, those servants, they did what they were told. They went out into the highways and they gathered together all whom they found, notice, both good and bad, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Don't you just love that? Don't you love how the Lord called you when you were bad? 
And I don't mean bad as in good. I mean bad. I mean when you were nasty. I love that the Lord called me when I was bad. When I had issues. When I wasn't good. I love that the Lord calls us when we think we're good. But the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there is none who does good, no not one. And I'm glad that the Lord loves us enough that He says, Come one, come all. Bad, good, indifferent, I don't care. Come one, come all. Now Jesus caught a lot of flack for that, didn't He? He was always being accused of hanging out with sinners. To which he replied in Mark 2.17, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now in verse 11, the parable speaks of a wedding garment. In our case, we would think of it as the wedding dress, which is traditionally white. Have you ever thought about why the wedding dress is, is white? I know until I got into this study, I know that I always thought that it was because it suggested or represented innocence and sexual purity. And in fact, in later years, it has come to represent that. But that wasn't originally the case. Originally, it was Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert in 1840, where the first white wedding dress was first noticed, or at least documented as being the first. And at that time, it was a symbol of wealth and status. Wearing a dress that you would wear only once, it was only the wealthy that could do that. It was only the wealthy that could afford something that could be laundered so white that it just was brilliant. But I find it interesting that both of these traditions I find particularly applicable and supported by Scripture. And it's always so exciting when you discover these things and how the world's handling things and you see the connection to the two. Listen to Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, it's not uncommon, as I'm counseling, doing pre-marriage counseling or pre-engagement counseling, I always ask that awkward question, are you behaving yourself physically? Are you sleeping again? And occasionally, they'll hang their heads down and they'll confess. And, and I'm able to just look at him and I'm able to say, listen, if you will just get on your knees and just repent and just ask the Lord his forgiveness, he will wash that sin away as white as snow. And to be able to tell him with all of the confidence and, and certainty that I have in my heart, to be able to say, and on your wedding night, there will be joy and blessing that you can't imagine because that's what the Lord does for us. He washes us as white as snow, though there our sins are like crimson, they shall be as wool. Revelation 9, 11, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse, Jesus, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His flames were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, that's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That's the wedding garment. And then pertaining to our wealth, our riches as Jesus' bride, Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 6.17, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Do you realize that you are a joint heir with Christ because of His precious blood? Ephesians 1 says that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So the next time you look at a wedding dress and you think, man, 
I'm married to the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. I've been made pure, and I'm married into some serious riches. That's what the Lord's done for us. But verse 11, when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. Somehow they must have thought they could come in without being made clean. And so he said to him, friend, how did you come here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Isn't it interesting? It says he was speechless. In other words, there's nothing that you can say. The only thing to say when you're confronted with your uncleanliness is, Father, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Please save me. Friend, how did you come here without a wedding garment? He was speechless. Verse 13, then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now we, we could take a few weeks just to consider all that Jesus is saying in verse 14, many are called, but few are chosen. However, suffice to say that I believe it is much simpler than what it appears to be. We see throughout the scriptures, especially in our text this morning, that God calls all to come to Him. But the reason that few are chosen, listen, the reason that few are chosen is not because of God, but because few choose Jesus. This is really what it boils down to. Sometimes when we read... Um, many are called, but few are chosen. We see Jesus in heaven. What do you think, Jesus? Uh, we see God in heaven saying, what do you think, Jesus? Heaven or hell? Heaven? Okay. What do you think? Heaven or hell? Not sure? Okay. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You, you know, I mean, that's sometimes the picture. Listen, that is not the case. The reason few are chosen is not because of God, but because few choose Jesus. With all of my heart, I do not believe God sits in heaven deciding who's going to go to hell and who's going to go to heaven. I believe that the best way for us to communicate His omniscience, his, it, the fact that He knows everything, is to say He chooses. When the reality is simply that He knows before we choose precisely what we're going to choose and who it is who's going to choose to come to the wedding. Let me say that one more time because it can be a little bit of a tongue twister there. Listen. The reality is simply that God knows before we choose precisely what we're going to choose because He's all knowing and who it is that is going to choose to come to the wedding. That's why He says, For many are called, but few are chosen because few choose Jesus. It's interesting, and I'll conclude with this, that in the Eastern culture, when someone important prepared a marriage feast, they would provide suitable wedding garments to be worn by the guests when they sat down to the banquet. And in the context of this parable, it is Jesus who has provided us with that wedding garment, that white wedding garment, signifying purity, signifying wealth and eternal riches. Listen to Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Ah, oh, how does that sound? He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. I want you to think for a moment about what you used to be like before you came to faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to think about for a moment what you may be like now without Jesus Christ and what it's like to be clothed with the robe of righteousness. Amen? Does that feel good? We've been clothed with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. You know, it's interesting, as I was thinking about this, I remember a day when people got dressed up for someone's wedding. You remember that? I remember as a kid, if you went to a wedding, number one, as a kid, it was like, oh, I just hope they have good food. That's all. I can't believe I've got to go through it. But I just remember your mom made you wear your best clothes, and if you didn't have a tie, you borrowed your dad's tie. It didn't matter if it matched or... You just, you needed to make sure that you, you look good. 
You never saw people in jeans and tennis shoes, but that's not the case anymore. And I think in some ways, it illustrates our attitude about heaven. People want to go to the wedding dressed any way they like, without accepting the wedding garment. But Jesus makes clear it does not work that way. God has invited us to the royal wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the marriage of sinful man and his son, Jesus Christ. And he has made it so that we put aside our ratty, old, filthy clothes and we put on the Lord Jesus Christ the robe of white righteousness. And if we think for a moment that we're going to make it to the wedding just wearing our... our uh, ratty old jeans and tennis shoes, listen, it ain't going to work. Because the Lord wants to put upon us the robe of righteousness that we would be ready to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. But the question is, is are you ready? Are you ready? Because I'm giving you an invitation right now. And only you and you alone knows if you've accepted the invitation to the wedding. And the Lord knows if right now the conversation's going in, you know, I realize this is your job, Pastor. I realize this is church. I realize this is what you do. But I got other things to do. I got a farm, I got a business. Listen, you never know when your life's going to come to an end. You just don't know. You know that's true. But what you can know is do you have the wedding garment to go to the wedding? Listen, you've been invited. You've been invited. I'm inviting you. The Word invited you. And the Holy Spirit right now is calling you to come. Father, we pray right now that your hand would be upon this place. Lord, we thank you for your word that declares so very clearly that all are invited to the wedding, but not all will accept that invitation. And Lord, I confess that there are times when I get discouraged. When I look upon a group of people like this and I know that there are some who have not accepted the invitation. And I know that breaks your heart. And Lord, I confess a fear according to your word for their eternal destiny. But oh Lord, how I love the word of God that declares all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With all of our heads bowed, if there are any of you here who have not accepted the invitation to the wedding feast to be married to Jesus, with all our heads bowed, would you just raise your hand so that I can see it and pray with you? Anyone at all, you know who you are. Don't be so proud. The Lord knows. The Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart. I and so many people in this room know these things are true because when we got the invitation to the wedding, we accepted it. Oh, it may have taken us a while, but we accepted it and we've been clothed with the robe of righteousness. Some of you may been walking in unrighteousness so long you can't even imagine what righteousness is like. Let me tell you, it's glorious. It's glorious. There's nothing like it. Anyone at all. 
You want to receive that wedding garment. You want to receive that invitation. You want to be assured of that place at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Just raise your hand so that I can pray with you. Anyone at all? Lord, how good you are to love us the way that you do. How comforting it is to be able to hold fast to your words which give us strength and give us an eternal perspective of things to come. We love you, Lord. We love being in your presence. Hallelujah. We just worship him for a few minutes. Thanking him for his faithfulness. For the day that he snatched us up out of our darkness established us upon the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Let's tell him what you want. Jesus, lover of my soul,
I pray that our prayer would be a desire to worship the Lord until the very end. Don't resist the Lord. Listen to your family members who are inviting you to the wedding. Go out and start inviting people to the wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me tell you, there is nothing like living for Christ. Amen? amen. Nothing like it, amen? Amen. Nothing like it. God bless you all. If any of you need prayer, please come forward. We always have people up here that are eager to pray with you. Encourage you in any way. Have a, have a blessed afternoon. We'll see a lot of you in the morning.